Well, I want to touch on why are there so many Bible translations in English in the the book that you were to read on the journey from text to translation by Wegner, he goes through a history of the various translation. And, and one of the things you're to think about for uh, your, your projects is um, on the whole area of, um, you know, how do these translations um, bring about a detrimental uh, impact on the church? I think that's something for us to consider uh, even right now practically. And so why, why in English do we have the various um, different um, translations that are available in our bookstore or online? Um, number one, English has changed over the years. So there are, there are certain denominations that um, love the, the King James Version, and they believe strongly in the authorized um, 1511. They hold to it. They, they believe that's the only translation that should be used for studying and preaching of God's Word. And so many good people will disagree on that. And and they use their, their primary um, manuscript as a Texas Receptus, and, and they see that as, as valuable for um, their own um, practice in, in worship. So is it is it good or bad to have uh, multiple different types of translation? And, and I'm going to say this, that, that it's not bad to have multiple translation. And I think um, the, the broad spectrum that we have in our um, translations today is an encouragement that we can pick up um, an NIV and look at a verse um, that maybe we're studying, we're preparing for a message, Bible study, and we are um, exposed to a new way of expression, a new way of, of understanding that, that unique verse. And I, I will encourage you that, and I, I would say this is the encouragement, um, the exhortation, when you think about our various translation, know that the committees who were assembled to uh, work on um, our various um, English translations, they, they sought with careful um, expertise to, to consider the words that they, and even the phrases that they chose as, um, as the um, breadth of their translation. And so um, it's important that you know that. Um, one thing that has helped me over the years is to read the introduction of each of your um, Bible. Um, depending on the, um, the publisher, they do a good job in, in giving a history of the, of the translation. And so, again, there are a, a ton of different um, major uh, English translation today. You have the Revised Standard Version version. Um, that came about in you know 1946, and later now today the ESV has replaced that as the common version. Um, you have the New American Bible 1970, the New English Bible 1970 also came out. Uh, the New American Standard Bible was kind of the evangelical uh, amongst the Baptist and Bible churches uh, movement that this was the primary book to be used for studying and getting the most accuracy out of the Greek and, and Hebrew um, Bible. You have the Living Bible, Ken Taylor, on his way to Chicago. He would um, write a section or verse um, uh, of a paraphrase, and that's not literally what we call a translation. It's a paraphrase in English. So he took a, um, a translation in English and broke it even further down into simple English for his children to um, use. Um, you have the, the um, New Living Translation uh, published through Tyndale, and there's the Amplified Bible, the Jerusalem Bible. So lots of translations that uh, Wegner goes over. You would do wise to review his chapter again on the development. Uh, one of the latest translation updates happened in 19, um, 1995 with the New American Standard Bible update. Uh, you may want to read up on the history on that. Um, you have the Zondervan that went um, and revised the, the New International Version. Again, um, read on the history on the English Standard Version done through Crossway. Uh, there are different styles and in, in theories or application to why we have certain translations that are being used today. You have the functional equivalence, and that's the translation of one language into another retaining as much as possible um, the original forms of that first language that, that the committee sought to um, examine. You have uh, the dynamic equivalence, and, and that's a translation of one language then into another um, with the goal. Um, here the goal is translating the meaning of the original 
um, without regard to the forms of, of the first language. And so you have functional and then you have dynamic uh, equivalents. Um, you have extremely literal translations that are used. And so the, the literal translations are seeking to line up word by word, phrase by phrase, um, Hebrew and Greek um, renderings into the corresponding um, language that's being translated. So for our case, it would be English. So that's um, some ways that there's um, what we call literal translation. And I would say, and this is just uh, my perspective, that most of our English translations um, often take on the, either the functional and or dynamic equivalent models, um, seeking to find what is best um, communicated back to the reader and, and, and arriving at the plain sense uh, of, of, of the word. Um, again, there are some comparisons to draw. For example, if you were to pull out your Bible and read uh, Ecclesiastes 1.14, uh, you would find that the New American uh, Standard Bible translates that phrase a little bit differently than maybe the New Living Translation. For example, New American Standard writes it this way, He who watches the wind will not sow, and he who looks at the clouds will not reap. Uh, the New Living Translation says, If you wait for the perfect conditions, you will never get anything done. So you can tell that how the translation committee sought to give the plain sense to the reader and any, even bring about a, a, an interpretation of what that verse uh, or a commentary of what that verse is trying to get uh, to for, for us. And so it breaks it down at very functional and dy dynamic equivalent levels. And so that, that would be helpful. There's a, you can look at Romans chapter 3, verse 21. Uh, New American Standard says this, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifest being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Well, New Living says it this way. But now God has shown us a different way of being right in his sight, not by obeying the law, but by the ways by the way promised in the scriptures long ago. So again, the point is that as you read Wagner's summary of the different dynamic and functional equivalency, the goal is not simply a battle for the Bible that one's translation is superior over another. But I think the goal here for you as a student is to walk away saying, praise God that we have multiple translations. That's the first thing to um, apply at the close of, of your week in your study. So praise God that we have multiple translations. I, number two, um, use the various English translations as tools in your toolbox. So there are going to be times where you need to pull out the New Living Translation because you're working with a younger people group and they're just not going to understand a more formal equivalency. And so the need to, to not dumb down the language but, but bring about a plain sense of the rendering of that language to the age group that you are ministering to. I, I think thirdly, it's just a way, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's another, uh, as I said, second toolbox, a tool, and let me just go a step further for number three, is for you to think about it in light of your own devotional practices. I, I think you can use these translations in a number of different ways for meditating, uh, praying through a passage, um, memorizing a, a verse um, in one translation versus another, and just thinking through very um, um, principalized ways of how one translation might um, pivot a certain phrase and now you're able to understand that a little bit clearer than maybe um, a more literal translation. So I, I would say that those are the three primary ways uh, to be thankful for the, the mul multiple translations. And then lastly, this is what I would say, um, be careful. Be careful to get on the bandwagon that one translation is superior over another. I just don't think that is a, a good conversation to have. I think you want to encourage people within your churches to read the Bible. And we're living in a culture where people don't read the Bible, they don't engage, they don't find meaning. And, and so to get on the bandwagon that the New American Standard or the ESV or the NIV is the primary uh, translation that we should be preaching from or teaching from, maybe, maybe not a helpful conversation in, within the context of your church and, and something not to fight over. And, and I would stay away from those churches that hold to a translation um, 
a translation war. They, they're going to fight over it, and they're going to go to the mat with you. Uh, it's probably not a church I would want to go to. So be wise and discerning um, those particular um, gatherings. And, um, and then praise God as, as a response um, that you have um, been blessed within the United States, that you have multiple translations to use for um, growing in Christ.